Welcome to USIP ICIP, a weekly podcast with Northern Lights Winery founder Doug Bell, exploring the experiences from leaders in business, social media, and family. Now, here's this week's exceptional guest. Welcome to USIP ICIP. I have James Douglas, great last name, by the way, because I am the host of the podcast, Doug Bell. Very nice to meet you. This is actually our first time meeting. Um, so I'm so thrilled to be able to introduce you to our audience. You are a filmmaker with Barker Street Media. And the other thing that I think is really interesting is you've had a long historic career um, in the film industry as an actor. You've been behind the camera. You've been in front of the camera. And now you're teaching, which is so cool. And uh, I just want to say thank you for coming in today. Oh, my absolute pleasure. It's really great to meet you. Absolutely. So uh, I want to give the audience a little bit of a precursor uh, on who you are, where you grew up, and and how you became a filmmaker. Sure. Um, I was born in Oshawa, Ontario, and spent the first few years of my life in Hamilton. I don't really remember much of that. My mom uh, was a single parent. Uh, We moved out to British Columbia when I was eight. I grew up in Vernon uh, in the Okanagan Valley. Uh, spent uh, most of my formative years there, got involved in community theater and high school musicals, that kind of thing. Realized pretty early on that acting was where I wanted to be, so I eventually made my way to the University of Victoria, where I took two years of their theater program at the Phoenix Theatres, which is the the theater department at UVic. And while I was there, I I really did get the bug and wanted to make sure that I was uh, trying to push myself out as far as I could and challenge myself as much as I could. So I auditioned for the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York in 1994 and wound up uh, being accepted to that uh, two-year acting program. Uh, Once I left New York, uh, because it was too expensive for me to stay as a Canadian in New York with no green card, uh, I traveled around uh, the country uh, doing whatever jobbing, uh, as a jobbing actor, doing whatever, whatever roles I could. I toured across Canada a couple of times with fringe festival shows and uh, some smaller productions. I got some small parts in independent films and television commercials, that kind of thing. And eventually found my way back uh, to Victoria and decided that I should probably do something with the uh, college credits that I had. So I finished my English degree at UVic. And while I was there, I uh, was introduced to a place called Barkerville Historic Town and Park. Um, A friend of mine who I had done some theater with was acting there in the summer. He, uh, in the summer of 1998, said, you've got to come up here. We have a role available uh, for somebody, and uh, it's a great place to stay, and it's a small town that you're living in. There's nowhere to spend your money, so you'll just you'll come back with a pile of cash, which turned out to be absolute hogwash. Um, there were two bars in the town, so therefore I didn't come back with any money at all. Uh, but uh, I fell in love with Barkerville uh, that first season. I thought it was just going to be a two-month gig, and I kept finding excuses to come back to Barkerville every summer, year after year. It's a really unique form of theater that's practiced there, and you get a chance to talk to people about their their past and uh, sort of allow them to sort of contemplate what's going on with their present. Good in- historical interpretation, as we call it, really does reflect on the present moment by telling stories of the past. So I just I just kept finding excuses to come back. I, I met my wife there. Um, we then eventually left Barkerville after about seven years uh, and then always said that if we'd if we had kids, we would love to go back to Wells and Barkerville to raise them because Wells, which is the small community that's just outside of Barkerville, at one time had 6,000 people in it. Um, and they built a full-sized elementary school. And now there's about 300 uh, full-time residents, but the school is still there. There's 14 kids, kindergarten to grade seven. Uh, they have a full-time teacher, a full-time administrator. So we, we just thought if, if we were fortunate enough to be given an opportunity to go back there, um, once we had kids, we would do that. And then and in uh, January of 2009, we gave birth to twins. Um, and in March of 2009, there was a call that was put out for a uh, marketing and communication specialist for Barkerville. And I threw my hat in the ring, got the job. We moved up in July. And then, uh, yeah, so f- since July of 2009, I've been a part of the administrative team at Barkerville, eventually moving from marketing into public programming and then media development. Because by then, I had met a fellow named Norm Coyne, who uh, was my ad sales rep at the Prince George Citizen when I was doing marketing for Barkerville. He and I hit it off, realized that we had a mutual love for film and specifically horror movies and sort of grindhouse stuff. So uh, with a couple of other friends, we started making short films uh, that we put out to various festivals. And then in uh, 2000, uh, what is it now, 2016, I heard about an opportunity uh, that Stephen King provides for emerging 
uh, filmmakers called the Dollar Baby Deal. I'd never heard of this before, but I'm a huge Stephen King fan. I have been since high school. And uh, um, the, there was a story that he wrote called The Doctor's Case, which was a Sherlock Holmes story that he'd written back in 1987 for a compendium of stories that was being put together to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the first Sherlock Holmes story. And The Doctor's Case, the conceit is it's the one and only time that that Dr. Watson solved a case before Sherlock for a reason that's outlined in the story. And uh, I'd always thought it would make a really cool film. Uh, somebody told me about this Dollar Baby deal. So I went onto Stephen King's website and looked it up. And sure enough, uh, this short story was part of the deal. So what it is, is Stephen King has a program where he has a number of uh, short stories that he hasn't currently licensed to anyone else. So he still owns the rights to them. And then for a dollar, if his team likes your pitch, they will give you the non-commercial, non-exclusive rights to make a film from that story. Uh, all it means is you're allowed to raise money to make the film. You can show it at festivals all around the world. You just can't sell it to a distributor without there being some additional agreement that's made between you and his legal team. Um, so in uh, 2017, we went uh, to Victoria and uh, filmed The Doctor's Case at Craig Derrick Castle there. Uh, we also filmed in Barkerville, which had been sort of our original inspiration for this Victorian murder mystery. And that just kind of everything sort of took off from there. Barker Street Cinema was formed as a result of that particular film. Uh, we showed The Doctor's Case at 40 different international festivals over the course of about two and a half years, won a bunch of awards. And we were able to parlay that success into some actual paid gigs as filmmakers. So, you know, part of Barker Street Cinema's mandate has always been to to help uh, foster the film industry here in Northern BC. Now, we don't want to move elsewhere. We want to be here. We want to be able to make films here with the people who also have the same kind of passion that we do. We want to be able to invite bigger productions to come in and use Prince George and the region as, as locations for their films too. Uh, so it was really great when we were able to start doing that um, about a year and a half ago, actually, in the first film that, that we co-produced. Um, uh, was called A Great North Christmas. And uh, we, we got together with a bunch of people. It was a very limited budget, uh, just over $200,000, but we were able to crew up and, and get a number of actors, who, some who flew in from Vancouver, but a, num a number of whom were here and uh, spent two weeks uh, with a great support from the city of Prince George. Uh, we were able to make a sort of a Hallmark style Christmas movie that has uh, since been distributed all through the United States and it will be actually uh, dropping on Apple TV Plus uh, on November 29th of this year. Congratulations, that's quite an accomplishment and that's a, a lot of work you've done um, over you know a period of time. Uh, and I really wanna get into the film industry and Prince George in particular um, shortly here, but before we do, um, I want to learn a little bit more about Barkerville because many of, the, of our audience aren't from Northern BC. They may not know what Barkerville is and, and what that experience is like because I think it's so unique within even Canada as a whole that what you get when you go there. Absolutely. Um, Barkerville is actually the largest historic site in Western North America. It's 140 restored wooden buildings, 107 of which are the original buildings built anywhere between about 1869 and about 1945. And it's a gold rush town. So Barkerville really is the, the heart of the Caribou Gold Rush. And it's a living history museum. So Barkerville hires professional actors who come in and dress in period costume, do things like deliver town tours, do water wheel demonstrations, all sorts of different kinds of fun activities for people. There's the Theater Royal, uh, which is a live professional theater. Uh, that produces shows every summer. Uh, you can go and, and see some great musical variety in a gold rush sort of style. There's 18 period businesses in Barkerville. So everything from your blacksmith shop to the print shop, you can go to the Mason and Daily, which is your general merchants sort of store. There's uh, a, a, a watchmaker and jewelry shop, uh, a place, El Dorado Gold Panning and Gifts, where you can go and get your t-shirts and your hats and that kind of thing. But also if you want to learn a little bit about how to gold pan and find gold in nature, they, they will give you lessons there. So it's really really uh, uh it's it's sort of a of, of a it's a large scale historic site that also doubles as a tourist attraction in the summer and brings tens of thousands of people to the region every year and has since uh, 1963 actually 62 I think actually is when they they first opened uh, Barkerville became a provincial park in 1958 it was never actually a ghost town the people who lived in Barkerville in the 1950s realized 
the importance of the heritage resource that was literally falling down around them because it's all buildings made out of wood. There's 29 feet of snow there in the wintertime. So that the weight of all of that snow was crushing some of the buildings. So as part of the British Columbia centennial, because uh, 1958 was the 100 year anniversary of BC becoming a crown colony, um, W.A.C. Bennett, the premier at the time, decided that he wanted to leave some sort of historical legacy and decided to, to take up the, the cause of Barkerville. So they turned Barkerville into a protected park. And then a couple of years later, they were able to start bringing, um, you know, tour guides in. And, and it was B.C. Parks at the time, but inviting people to come and spend their summers uh, camping out in the in the Barkerville area. And it's just it's blossomed ever since then. So for almost 60 years now, Barkerville has been the premier um, heritage attraction attraction in Canada. Yeah, it's a it's a blast. I've been there many, many times over my life and everything every single time you you go, it's like you're transported back to the 1800s during the gold rush era. Um and, and having the actors on site is just so critical to that experience because when you go in, they're talking in in you know, an accent and tones the way that they used to. They're dressed up uh the way that they would be in the 1800s, you know, and you get to see all of these structures and I think it gives us a little bit of a reference point because we're so, you know, transposed by the environment that we're in right now that sometimes we don't really believe that things were so much different, not even that long ago, really. I mean, uh, when my when my mother grew up, uh, Prince George was, you know, a quarter of the size that it is now. And it's hard to believe that different areas and neighborhoods that are around here that are so new uh, didn't exist, not even, you know, 20 years ago, or 40 years ago, 60 years ago. So it's really interesting uh, when you get a chance to experience that, and I highly recommend everybody does. Um, so you have uh, you started out as an actor. You did a bunch of things as well. Is there any notable roles that you really uh, pride yourself on that uh, that kind of built you into the career you have now? Um, well, actually, one of the one of my favorite uh, things to do, um, one of the favorite roles that I played, um, was there's a, a Toronto playwright uh, named Di Daniel McIver who is quite famous in Canadian theater circles now, but at the time he was sort of the upstart young uh, theater kid uh, in Toronto. And he'd written a number of plays that were sort of, um, they, th it was at a time when, when um, you know, because production, large scale productions were getting so expensive for people to tour uh, or even just produce anywhere, even in Toronto, um, there was a, a real sort of push in the early nineties to kind of scale things back and try to tell big stories with small amounts of people. And he wrote a play called Never Swim Alone, um, which has a very sort of avant-garde kind of feel to it. Although it's a very, it's a very real and very interesting story about two guys who had been childhood friends and some traumatic experience experience happened to them uh, that caused them to, to form a rift and they they stopped being friends and they became competitors in business, in life and everything else. And so the story of Never Swim Alone takes place on a beach and it's uh, it's done in the style of almost like a wrestling match. So it's it's two guys in business suits on a sandy beach who are competing with each other to see which one of them is the better man. And they're being judged by a, a almost silent um, sw cross, uh, swim, uh, like a, like a lifeguard, uh, a lifeguard at the beach. Uh, so a woman in a bathing suit sitting in a, in a high towered chair, and she's basically, um, presenting them with the various challenges that they have to do and then scoring them as they go along. And it's done in, in, in very much a competition style. So they're, they're given sort of the parameters of the particular kind of thing that they do. There's a lot of, uh, syncopated, um, speech so as they're because they're competing to see which one of them is the best man that they can be a lot of the stuff that they're saying is happening at the same time there's some really interesting choreographed movements throughout and then this woman is scoring them as they go and then throughout the course of the play you start to realize that there is a backstory between these two people and that there's a reason why they once went they went from being really good friends to being enemies and then it starts to become revealed that the woman who is doing the judging actually plays into that story uh, that had broken them up in the first place. And, and it becomes an expose of this really tragic experience that they'd had involving the drowning of a young woman while they were all competing in a, in a swim competition across a lake. And so it's got this really sort of 
almost, uh, it's metatheatrical for sure, but it's also got this kind of magic realism to it as these two guys kind of trying to work out their struggles and deal with, finally deal with the emotional impact that this very traumatic event happened on them. And when we toured that across Canada, myself and a fellow named TJ Daw, who has since become a, a fringe festival darling across Canada, he's, he's one of the guys who sells out his shows everywhere he goes. He's sort of a monologist, uh, much like Sp Spalding Gray. Um, he tells a lot of stories about his life and, and in a comedic fashion, but it always sort of ends up with some kind of emotional impact at the end uh, so it was tj and i it was both of our our first fringe festival tour just straight out of college and uh my girlfriend at the time a woman named Catherine watkins uh, played the woman on the beach and when we toured um never swim alone across canada it was actually the first time that one of mciver's plays had ever left toronto and toured right across canada so that that was very exciting for us and then on the other end of it we actually had an opportunity to meet daniel mciver through a whole series of happy accidents and get a chance to talk with him about that and how special it was for him that we were able to to take this little nugget of a play and tour the country with it so even though it's one one of the one of the earlier ones in my career it's one of the ones that has always stuck with me um, as a director um, I had a really excellent opportunity to travel to Prague in 2004 and be the assistant director for a show at the National Theatre of the Czech Republic under uh, the direction of a fellow named Charles Morowitz and Charles Morowitz was an avant-garde director from the 1960s who is actually from New York, but he wound up in London in the 60s and he wrote uh, theater criticism for the London Evening Standard and then ultimately started a, um, a theater company of his own called The Open Space, which ran for 20 years in London before he moved back to the States. And um, uh, the play that we were working on together um, was called um, Pokoshini, which is Czech for temptation. And it's a Dr. Faustus style play. So about a guy who sells his soul to the devil, basically. Um, and it was written by Václav Havel, who was the first democratically elected president of the Czech Republic. He served for 15 years. And then in 2003, he retired. And in 2004, uh, the Czech Republic was being entered into the EU. And so the National Theatre, for the first time since Havel had become president, decided to put on one of his plays. Temptation was the one that they decided to produce. And they hired Charles, who I had already worked with a couple of times by then, to uh, direct the show because he was very famous in European avant-garde uh, circles, for sure. Uh, and it was very interesting because I got to go over there with him and we were the only two people in the, in the whole crew that didn't speak Czech. The play was being produced in Czech, but we had a translator that worked with us. So we were able to work with the actors who spoke their native language. We spoke English. By the time we finished the rehearsal process, we all knew the play inside and out in Czech. There was no question about it. But the most amazing thing about that for me was that the theater that we were actually performing in or producing the show in was called the Narodny Devodlo, which uh, translates to the Estates Theater. And I don't know if you've seen the movie Amadeus, uh, which is about uh, Mozart. Well, all of the opera scenes in that movie were filmed at the theater that we were working in. So every day for three months, I was going to this theater that Mozart had actually premiered Don Giovanni in 1787 in that theater, and he conducted the orchestra himself from stage. So it was just this incredible, uh, you know, really close piece of history. And just being able to be there every single day, I knew that this was uh, an opportunity that I was probably never going to have again. And then, of course, I moved from theater into film. Uh, I didn't really have any, I, I mean, quite honestly, most of the roles that I had were in independent features that died a death in video stores uh, a long time ago. Uh, I had a couple of uh, interesting uh, things. I was involved in a chat, series of chat line commercials uh, back in the in the 90s that my cousin produced that, in fact, was the birthplace of the career of Evangeline Lilly who uh, went on to do Lost, and now she's the Wasp in Ant-Man and the Wasp and those kind of yeah. movies. But she actually started in that series of commercials that I was involved in as well. So there was a little bit of, of, of the touching of greatness there at the time. But I very quickly realized with my career that um, I was just really interested in staying working as an actor. I knew that I would consider myself a success if I could if I could say that, you know, regardless of what kind of films that I were doing or what kind of plays that I was doing or if I was working in Barkerville, whatever, if I was able to use the things that I had learned in theater school to continue to to put food on my table and do that consistently, then that's that was success for me. I never really had um, aspirations to be a movie star or anything like that. I just wanted to be able to use my craft to make a living. And I'm happy to say that, you know, 30 years on, I've been able to do that. As an actor, most um, most people are in it because they want to tell a story. 
right? And the story, the serving the story is the most important part of any um, actor's journey and the entertainment that comes out of it is really extreme. So tell me about how that is impactful for you and how you bring a story to life, whether it's a play or whether it's a movie or whether it's in your class teaching your students. I, I well, you've said it right there, serving the story. That's exactly our motto at Story Institute. It's also sort of been my motto going all the way through. The reason that I got into theater and acting in the first place was because I loved story, stories. I loved storytelling. I, I was the kind of kid who would go and see a movie. I would just love that movie. And then I would go home and I would act it out in front of my mom. You know, like I would show her all of the different things that was what's happening. And I'd do the sound effects. I'd do the music. And I just wanted, in fact, the very first play that I remember being involved with uh, was when I was in daycare uh, back in the day when we were living in Hamilton. My mom was a master's student at McMaster's University and I went to uh, a daycare center and I had recently seen The Wizard of Oz um, and uh, I was just absolute, I was in love with Judy Garland but I also loved the story. Um, so I got a bunch of kids together and we figured it out. We figured out all the, the beats of the film and and then presented it for, for the school at one lunchtime uh, where we all took on characters. I think I was the Scarecrow at that time or something like that. Um, but it, it's the, it's the story itself. And I, then that's why, like, as I went into theater and realized that not only did I not just want to be an actor, I wanted to do all of the different things. And I've done every job imaginable in theater and film now, um, because it was just being a part of that, being part of a group of people who's, who all had a particular goal. And that was to tell a story and tell it as well as we possibly could. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus that's placed on celebrity movie stars and that kind of thing. And, and many of them are really good actors. So it's great when they can sort of cross over between those two worlds. But one of the reasons why I never was interested in that was because I think a lot of times people, there are some people who go into the acting profession because they want people to pay attention to them. It, it's not really about the creation of the final product itself necessarily. It's about the attention that they seek. And one of the things that we talk about at Story Institute, the school that I uh, have recently opened here in Prince George, is a an actor's role the actor's job is to serve the story and it's much better for an actor to be engaged than engaging and that's something that a lot of you know early actors need to learn because they they just are they're just emulating behavior that they see so they think that i need to make sure that everybody's paying attention to me we need to look at me when in reality, it's what you're looking at as an actor in a scene. It's what you are experiencing that actually makes you the most interesting person to watch. It's watching somebody react to something as much as the acting that they're doing that actually helps uh, create a very good performance. And when everybody's doing that, then you're just elevating that story uh, as far as it can possibly go. And that's when you get the real magic that happens both on stage and in screen. And, and when you get those students that come in that are, engaged in it because they are looking for that fame or that, you know, notoriety. How do you kind of address that? I, you kind of mentioned it, but do you try and, and talk about how important it is for them like to go through a process of learning to getting from step A to step Z or for them, you know, in, in today's day and age, people are kind of afraid of maybe putting in the work. Like how, how do you kind of get that message across? Well, it is. It is definitely a progression. There's no doubt, and it's it is interesting, especially when you're when you're when you're meeting new students who are coming in for the first time. People have always, you know, all of us watch movies and watch television and that kind of thing. So we have, in some way, the arts have touched our lives, and acting has touched our lives, and so many really good professional actors make it look really easy. So sometimes when you get new people who are coming into the profession and, and, and wanting to come to a school or wanting to participate in a community theater project or an independent film, they assume that it's going to be easy because it looks easy when they're when they're watching it. But it's not. It is work. It's a job just like anything else. And to be really good at it, you do need to start with some very basic techniques and then build upon those techniques as you go. Um, actually, I used to I used to teach snowboard um, back in the day at Troll Mountain uh, between Wells and Barkerville, and th I, that's where I really learned about this concept of. The progression because I'd been a skier and I had a bunch of friends who seemed to me like a bunch of lazy 
guys uh, who were really good at snowboarding. So I just assumed right away that as long as I just went out with them a couple of times, they showed me the ropes, I'd pick it up no problem, and then everything would be great. And I spent an entire season on my ass, like just screaming at the sky, crying, beating the snow, because I just couldn't figure out how it was that I couldn't translate the stuff that I already knew about skiing and being on the snow to what this whole new experience was. And, and then I took my instructor's course because I decided that I wanted to, to help the, the ski hill. They needed some snowboard instructors. So I, I actually took a course and realized that there's a progression that you need to learn. You need to know exactly how to balance on the board first. Then you need to know a little bit about the edges of the board. Then you need to know about how to move your body in, in two different ways because when you're first starting snow, it's all about twisting your upper body in order to get your lower body to go where your upper body is leading it. But the more advanced you get, in fact, you learn that that's exactly backwards. It's all about your feet and what they're doing, but you need to go through that first part of moving your upper body like a clunky idiot first before you can get to the, the actual more advanced stuff. And that's one of those things about teaching that has always stuck with me. And it's why I hammer home with my students now. Like you may feel like you're crashing and burning right now, but we need to, we need to start at the very beginning, give you some, some very basic skills, look at a scene, the way a scene is devo devised, look at the various parts of an actor's job. So we, we use a, um, as a reference, something called the great opera which is not uh, unique to Story Institute. It's, it's an acting uh, theorem that's been around for, for generations now. But uh, it's called the Great Opera because each of, it's an acronym. So each of the letters stands for something. So the G in great stands for goals, for example. Every participant in a scene, say you and I are, are in a scene from a movie and we've just taken that scene out and we're analyzing that scene and we're having a conversation of some sort. There's going to inherently be some sort of conflict in that scene regardless of if whether it's a fight or you know or a conversation that even we both might want the same things but there's going to be some kind of kind of inherent conflict because all drama involves conflict and movies and film and everything it, it's all about drama so if there's a conflict that's going on in this scene each one of us is going to have a goal we're going to have something that we want to achieve within that scene and so that goal is going to have stakes, right? Because there's risks and rewards with a goal. If I want you to hand me your glass of wine because my glass of wine has run out and I really want that glass of wine. So my goal is to get you to give me that glass of wine. And your goal is could be something completely different. You could, you're could you not even thinking about the wine. You want me to continue to tell you some stories about myself. Maybe you want to try and get me to tell you something that I don't normally share with other people. But if my goal is to get that glass of wine, then I have to figure out what are the stakes of that? What are, what are, what's the reward if I get you to do that? Well, the reward is obviously the glass of wine. And maybe in my backstory, I've got some reason why I really desperately need that glass of wine right now. What's the risk if, if you don't give it to me? Then we move on to that and we look at sort of the, the result of that goal, whether you get your goal in a scene or not. And then uh, whether you do or not, what is your emotional response to that result? But it all boils down to that goal. In any given scene, each of the members of that scene have a goal that they want to achieve. And whether they achieve it or not, based on all of these things that they do, is what really elevates the drama. So using each of those letters in the great opera, we actually go through week to week. These are the sort of techniques that you're going to use as an actor because ultimately trying to serve the story, what an actor does is want to create the idea of truth in unrealistic situations. Everything from, you know, you know, being in a situation like imagine you're an actor in a big Marvel movie and you've got like just green or blue screens all around you and you're acting at a tennis ball, which is supposed to be Thanos, you know, you want the audience to believe that you believe that situation. And of course, there's no way an actor in that situation can actually believe that they are, you know, in the midst of the Battle of New York and there's aliens flying around them and everything else. They can't. It's it's, it's such an artificial environment. But if they follow certain steps and know that I'm going to prepare my scenes in a particular way that will show that I'm thinking about it in a particular way, the audience that's watching those scenes will then believe that you believe it. And that's what good performances are about. You can tell right away if somebody is not grounded in a scene, if somebody is just um, parroting something or is just, you know, reading lines and not actually invested in the emotion of a particular scene, you can always tell. And that's bad acting. But if you want to get a good actor and you want to see a good actor in a scene, you'll know that they are actually making it 
their job to ensure that you get a chance to see them believing that. And that's what we teach at Story Institute is this is your job. These, this is the work. It's hard work. It's not as easy as you think it's going to be. But if you follow these steps with us, you'll be able to do it. I think it's probably also important that a lot of people who are invested in in kind of gaining this um, opportunity to do film understand that uh, by going through a process or uh, a program like yours, it's just giving them such a heads up and an opportunity because if they try and just approach it like, oh, I'm a good actor myself, then they don't get the background. I think a lot of times we like to jump ahead and we don't uh, like to invest in the work that it takes to get somewhere. Absolutely, especially if we have some kind of talent in a particular way. And there's lots of people who have talent for performing. They like to be in front of people, you know, they, they can make people laugh in a crowd and they get a lot of positive reinforcement from people along the way. Then what happens is they wind up plateauing though, because you really only can take that so far. You know, I mean, I was really good in college of writing essays the night before and getting A's on them, right? But eventually I realized that that's not something that I could sustain. I could, I could charm my way through certain things. And then after a while, when it came right down to doing things like at a master's level or something like that, I actually had to put in the work. And by then I hadn't, wasn't accustomed to doing the work. So it took me even longer to figure out how to actually make things work in that way. And it's the same with acting. Yes, you can be a really charming person. You can, you can be, you can talk easily in front of people and you can get to a certain level with a performance. But if you really want to sort of, you know, put your, put your, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and actually do the work that will bring you to the next level, that's when people really start to blossom. And that's when you can start booking roles. Because it's the people who put in the work that book. There's thousands of people that are auditioning for roles every single day. There might be a hundred people that's auditioning for a two-line role in a movie that you're up for. But if you can show a casting director that you've put in that work, that you've seriously considered what the environment of this, this scene is, you know, what the relationships are between you and the people in these scenes, what, you know, what your goal is, what the stakes of that goal is, you're already... 10 steps ahead of the competition because a lot of those people, what they're doing is just trying to go in and charm their way through it. But if you show that you've put in that work, that's the spark that casting directors are going to see. Now, speaking of a lot of work, uh, years ago, Vancouver was not very well known for films. As a matter of fact, Canada wasn't. We talked about Hollywood a lot, um, you know, building that culture. But now it seems like uh, film is spreading out across the globe and across North America. And there's opportunities to create film great quality film all over the place. And part of that obviously is technology. And part of that is, is the ability for actors to travel. And, and um, But what we've noticed here in the last few years, thanks to you and several other people like Norm, and, uh, we, we've started to see film uh, becoming more centralized in the Prince George region. Uh, tell us a little bit about that process and being kind of the spark that is leading this charge for a very exciting time for Prince George. Well, we definitely came into the right place at the right time. I mean, obviously, Prince George does have a history of um, some fairly big budget films that uh, that shot here in the late 80s and the early 90s. Sarah Shack, who was the film commissioner uh, here in the North for quite some time, was really responsible for bringing shows like Reindeer Games, which, by the way, I think gets uh, a bit of short shrift. It's not that bad a movie. Uh, but Reindeer Games, uh, there was Dreamcatcher, the Stephen King film that was here. Uh, Double Jeopardy, I think, shot in and around that time. So I, I give Sarah a tremendous amount of credit for the work that she was doing because she recognized the the value of some of the locations that were here uh, in the north. But of course, then things fall away and everything's sort of centralized around Vancouver. Um, but there was all, also still a number of people, John Chuby being one of them in the last 10 years, who's done a tremendous amount of work uh, here, uh, you know, you know, promoting Prince George in the region as, as a place to film because he's been very successful with some of the stuff that he's done. Six Sigma is another group here that does primarily, um, you know, a lot of corporate and other and other sorts of videos. But there are a bunch of creative guys, Jason Hamburg, and those guys are, are great. So it, there's always been a base of people here that has made it uh, made us realize that if we were going to try and film something here in Prince George, at least there was some talent and experience here that we could draw upon, and and then you know allow that to be something that you're able to sell to a company that's coming in. Um, but of course, um, as Vancouver fills up and you're right, it's digital, like the digital form has, has totally revolutionized film and the whole idea of streaming services now versus broadcast television. You know, there's hundreds of streaming channels out there, 
All of them need content all of the time. Any of them that are involved in Canadian streaming, they need Canadian content. So that has really helped Canada as a whole uh, and the West in particular as, as a place to start building these things. So Hallmark, of course, comes in, does a lot of work in Vancouver. Now all of those studios are filled up. So they start to move to Kelowna. Now Kelowna is exploding and it's starting to get full up too. They're looking for the next place that they can bring these Hallmark Christmas movies to or other kinds of lifetime you know, romances and stuff. And so we realized um, that Prince George is a perfect op- has a perfect opportunity, especially for Christmas movies, uh, because of the snow, right? I mean, one of one of the greatest attractors for a place like this for some people to live uh, is all of this snow. But for for filmmakers, especially if you're looking to make Christmas movies, this is the place to be. Um, so that's when we got involved with with Sarah. Actually, Sarah Shack um, has a production company of her own, um, and uh, she and Norm and I sort of talked about what it would be like to try and do uh, a Christmas movie here. And um, we got involved with a fellow named Igor Prince uh, from Prince Films, which is based out of Los Angeles. It's a distributor. They were looking to kind of break into the Christmas market as well. We had a very, very limited budget. Like when you consider the fact that uh, the traditional Hallmark Christmas movie has a budget of about three and a half million dollars, our budget was a less than a tenth of that it was about 240 grand uh but we knew that there was a lot of goodwill here and there was a lot of people who were excited by the idea of of us doing this the city of prince george was so helpful to us so we decided you know what let's just throw our hat into the ring and see what we can do and see if if there is a way that we can help foster this film industry that has still been chugging along sort of under the radar here and kind of exploded a little bit more And we had such a great experience with A Great North Christmas, which we shot not this past March, but the March before in 2020, Um, right? 2021, Uh, right in the, the, you know, in the midst of the pandemic. So that was a challenge all in its own, but we had proper pandemic protocols and everything else. We had, uh, we had, we had to go through a lot in order to make that happen, but I was so happy that we did. And then we were able to bring in uh, A Way to the Heart just a few months later, uh, which was not a Christmas movie, but another Hallmark style um, romantic comedy, I suppose. And then uh, our company has been involved with, but wasn't directly involved with a couple of other features that were shot over in this past year. Um, But we're really looking forward to bringing more stuff in. And one of the things that, and that's one of the reasons why we decided to, to, Press go on Story Institute because the thing that we realized talking with um, you know a, n- a number of the crew and a number of the producers that were coming in from outside of Prince George is that what's going to make a place like Prince George really viable for another company to come in is to know that there is a certain percentage of their crew and cast that they can go local for because that saves so much money. And when you're dealing with budgets, even a three and a half million dollar budget, which is considered to be a micro budget in the in Hollywood terms these days, every line item counts. So if you don't have to spend, you know, an extra $6,000 on flying people in from Vancouver, actors, for example, right, that are going to be playing some of the smaller roles in a film, then that $6,000 you get to spend on something else and you you have a very limited budget. So if if there was that uh, talent that was available here who were not only talented people as far as being on screen, but actually knew what they were doing because they'd actually had some training. Or if, as we would ultimately like to see with Story Institute, it become a full-blown film school, if there are people who can be your grips, you know, the people who can help with your lighting or be the camera assistants who are already here, it's just gonna help those budgets so much. Plus you get the tax incentives of being as far away from Vancouver as, Prince George is, it just makes it a really viable option for companies coming in. And that's what we want to do. We want to be able to provide a a good solid base of talented and trained people here in the North who are going to be available for when these other companies want to come in. It's going to make it more attractive for them. And then they're going to start coming in year after year after year. And then we also want to be able to provide opportunities for those people here to create their own work here in the North so that they don't feel like they have to move away and go to Vancouver to be in the film industry. They can actually start producing their own independent things here, actually get funding um, streams in order to fund their projects, find distributors from here, find agents from here. We just want to continue to build on this momentum and actually create a homegrown uh, film industry here in the North. This is so much fun. I can tell you that this is something that the the region really appreciates. And I think it's so cool when you see somebody who's taking an industry that is, I mean, not maybe not completely new, but has not been around in this region. And you are bringing it forward with a very holistic approach, which is incredibly important. Um, I'm really fascinated to see what you are going to do in the future and, and definitely seeing lots of these 
feature films come is going to be a part of that um, as well as your school. Um, and if people want to follow you on this journey, where can they find you? Well, there's lots of different avenues, to be perfectly honest, because of a variety of things that I'm involved in. If you're interested in finding out more about the film and acting television program that we're doing through Story Institute, um, Story Institute, of course, is a, is a long-running school out of Vancouver run by a fellow named Michael Coleman, who was one of the stars of The Doctor's Case, my very first feature film. Um, but uh, So Story Institute, Pr Prince George, which just opened this past September, you just go to storyinstitute.ca, and there's options to look at both the Vancouver campus and the Prince George campus. My email address is also there, so you can email me directly. It happens to be James Douglas at storyinstitute.ca, so it's pretty easy to remember. But of course, there's our Barker Street Cinema website as well. So barkerstreetcinema.com has a lot of things about the various projects that we're working on as independent filmmakers here in the North. Um, we're all over Facebook and other forms of social media, so Barker Street Cinema on Facebook. Um, Story Institute is also on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. We, we're, we're on all of the platforms. But if you want to just get directly in touch with me, um, I'm the real James D on uh, on Facebook as well, and that's R E E L James D, the real James D, uh, James at BarkerStreetCinema.com, um, or just come down to the school. I'm there six days a week, so you can come down. It's uh, on the corner of uh, Quebec and Third, one two nine nine Third Avenue. It's the uh, C three Community Market or Q3, rather, Community Market. It's also CFIS, the local community radio station is in there. We're just downstairs in one of the old bank vaults. It's mm -hmm. uh, a really interesting place to run a school out of, but uh, it's also, it's it's kind of a cool place to be. Well, this has been such a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming in today and for what you're doing for the industry and for the North and for Prince George. Thank you so much. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you again as you continue to do this in the future. Today, we've been drinking some Cuvée Blanche to get you all ready to go. I know you got a class to teach later on. But uh, until next week, thank you so much. This has been You Sip by Sip. Cheers. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for listening to You Sip, I Sip. Please hit the five-star rating and leave us a review. If you'd like to learn more about Northern Lights Winery, text us at 604-670-4046 or visit us on social media at Northern Lights Winery.